the next step in testing our hack CPU is to put, put in some instruction memory so that we can load some instructions that does something interesting and wire up some RAM memory on the output side to watch as the instructions are taken in by the CPU uh, what, they, what the impact of those instructions actually are on our RAM. And then we tick the program counter watching the instructions come through the CPU with their impact on RAM. So this needs to be sort of the next test bench that we implement in order to carry on with testing of our hack CPU. So I think it makes sense to start with the circuit that I built to test the program counter. So uh, let's remove the ground pin from the input. So let's insert a RAM com or ROM component that Logisim provides for us in order to provide the uh, program instruction input. The, the hack CPU specification defines the ROM as needing a 32K by 16. So to get 32K worth of addressing space, we need 15 bits. And our data bit width is going to be 16 bits wide. And I think we'll change this view to be, let's see what we have here. Yeah, let's do classic Logisim. That's just more compact. Yeah, that looks better. So to wire up the ROM is pretty straightforward, but uh, one a slight complication is that the program counter that I defined on the CPU, I defined it as 16 bits, but in actuality, it can only address up to 32K, which is 15 bits. So uh, in order to tie off, you know, the... Uh, the address input is, is the program counter because that's how we access instructions. Uh, and, but, but this is a 15-bit address because it only stores 32K. And the program counter that I defined on the CPU, I defined it as 16 bits, even though in reality it, it probably should only be 15. But that's okay. We'll just use a splitter. And then we'll just mate them together like so. And now the data output, that's a 16-bit word. And our instruction input is also 16 bits. So this should just directly wire. And that's all it takes for instruction input. Now, how do we, or what are we going to do for RAM? So if you watch the prior videos, you'll, you, you know that I built RAM modules, again, following kind of along how the book outlines it. I built RAM modules out of discrete circuits, just again, as a learning exercise. But the reality is I'm eventually going to want to synthesize this on real hardware. And the... RAM modules built out of discrete components don't scale well on an FPGA. They use a lot of use a lot of the floor plan, uh, and so most FPGAs have block RAM, and they're dedicated really for the the purpose of of, of synthesizing RAM, and it minimizes resource utilization on the die. And so uh, the RAM that is implemented by Logisim takes advantage of this. So it just makes sense to just continue to use or to start to use the RAM component that's built into Logisim because it synthesizes it correctly in the end. And, and the pinouts are almost identical to what we were building in the first place. So uh, let's simply use the RAM. And uh, again, I'm going to change this to classic because it's more compact. And we also want to use line enables because we want the output to be uh, enabled all the time, essentially. Right, so how do we wire this up? So first of all, addressing. And again, my addressing coming out of the CPU was 16 bits, but in fact, we, we can't address 16 bits of address for RAM. Uh, we can only address 14 bits. And so again, like down here, 
We need a splitter to get the sizing of the input address down to something that the RAM will consume. Oh, and I guess, first of all, we need to set the addressing of our RAM. So this is going to be uh, 14 bits by 16. And so now we need, again, we need splitters. So So we'll hook our address up just like that. So next signal uh, is write enable, and that's very simple. That's just taking off on the right M signal and feeding that into, if I can get my wire to work, here we go, write enable, just like that. Uh, and the next signal, the clock, very important, and I have the clock tunneled. So we will just create ourselves a clock. And connect it like so. Next signal is uh, the uh, data input. So the data input to the RAM comes from out memory, the out memory signal. So that's straightforward. And then data output from the RAM it needs to get fed into the input, memory input on the CPU. Yeah, we'll just do that maybe. Okay, on the uh, NANDA Tetris website, there's a zip download where um, all the various project files for the various chapters, I'm sure you've done this by now, but uh, up to up to this point, I haven't really needed it. Uh, but, you know, we need some of the programs to put in the CPU to test. So uh, I've downloaded this and um, I've put it in Nanda Tetris. That's the default directory. And then we're on chapter five. So it's ordered by chapter. And the simplest program that they have in here to test is called add.hack. The suffix hack, suffix hack refers to the fact that this is in machine language. This is a, a file that's in hack machine language and the way that they do this, let's go ahead and open this up. It, so there, the machine language format that, that uh, the hack architecture uses is basically one line for each instruction and every instruction is encoded in binary. Now our ROM it looks looks to me like it wants things in hex. So each one of these is a four-digit hex number. And so what we need to do is transcode each one of these values into hex. Now, I, I could write a program to do that, and I, maybe I will. Um, but for now, uh, let's just do it by hand. Take the number, take the number two, probably add that into the D register. Number, put the number three in, sum the, the two together, load the zero address, and then store the result into the zero address. That's sort of what this looks like it's doing. And I remember reading the description of the program. That's what it does. It adds two and three together and it sticks it at RAM location zero. So that sort of all jives. So let's um, type this into the ROM. And that is our program. Let's, let's go ahead and disassemble these mnemonics because it really is important to know exactly what each one of these are doing. So um, first of all, it's important to uh, know what all these bits do. And again, so this is the, the I bit that tells you whether you're dealing with an instru um, A instruction or C instruction. These next two are a don't care. 
The next bit is the uh, is the A bit. This is the C. The next six bits are the C bits. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have three D bits for destination. And then we have three more bits for jump. This is the C. One, two, three, four, five, six bit. And this is the D. One, two, three. And the J. One, two, three. Okay. So now we have these lined out and know which column we're dealing with. Okay, so let's transcode these things. So if this is a zero, that means we're dealing with an A instruction. And so that means we're loading a value to the A register. So this is loading two to the A register. And the way this, so if we disassemble this, the way in hack assembly language this is represented is through A for load address, load A register with a two. Next instruction. So we're dealing with a one, so we know we have a C, a C instruction. The next two one ones are a don't care, they mean nothing. Uh, the next value, the, uh, the A bit being zero, means that when we do operations with the ALU, we're dealing with um, operations having to do with the, uh, the A register. The C bits, one and two are ones, and the rest of the C bits are zeros. And so that deals, that basically says take, uh, sorry, take a register A, which just got loaded with two, and I bet we're going to plop it into the destination. So we look at the destination flags, and that's 010. And the 010 flag destination means D. So in, in, in essence, what this means is D equals A. Next instruction. So this is at three, right? Because this bit is zero, so we're dealing with a, uh, an A instruction. So we're going to load A with three. Now this instruction. So again, C instruction, the next two are do not cares. The C bits, uh, sorry, so the, uh, the, the A bit is zero, meaning we're dealing with the A instruction. And then the C bits are, right, so we're dealing with four zeros and a one. That means D plus A, which makes sense because that's, that's what this is supposed to doing. So we're going to take D and we're going to add it to A. And then we're going to put it somewhere. So on this side, so we're taking D plus A, and we need a destination for where that's going to go. So that's what these three bits are for. Right? And so again, that's going to put it back into D. Right? So D equals D plus A. Because these are the destination bits, and they say stick it in D. Zero, 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 010 zero means put it in D. Okay, so now this instruction says, again, because it's an A instruction, it's zero. It means we want to put all zeros in A. So we want to do that. And now what does this next instruction do? It's a C instruction. Two ones do not care. The A bit means we're working with the A register. And then the C bit, C bits, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so we have um, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. So I'm on page... Um, on page 67 of the book. Yeah, so 001100 means D. So we're going to do something with D. And my guess is we're going to stick it in M. So what are our destination bits? 001. Uh, destination bits are decoded on page 68 of the book. Yeah, so 001 means M. So we're going to stick D, the value of D, into the memory location pointed to at M, and that memory location is the zeroth memory location. Let's let's execute this program now and see what happens. First clock tick should load two into the A register. So right away, we see that the, the address value, okay, well, yeah, so the address register uh, is exposed with address M. That is that is the output of A. So uh, having two loaded into it makes perfect sense. So, okay, so far so good. So we've just executed this instruction. So now we turn the clock off. Now we're going to execute the next instruction, which was to load D from A. 
Now we don't see anything happen because we don't have the deregister exposed, although the program counter ticked, uh, ticked up. So now we're at this that now we're at this instruction. So we assume that the two got put into D, but we can't really tell because we don't have D exposed. So now we're going to load three into the address register. Okay, there's three over here. So so far this is making sense. Uh, next instruction should be, should do the uh, summation of D and A. So we should get a five put back into D, but we won't see that because we don't have D exposed. Okay, so next instruction is we're going to load zero into the uh, address register because we're going to set up where we're going to put the destination for the five. It's gonna, we're going to stick it in the first memory location at address zero. Okay, so now we have the zero put into uh, the address, the, the A register. And I think I clicked, uh, I think I clicked too. Yeah, I clicked too far, unfortunately. Oh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay, so we have, uh, I think I just clicked past it. Well, the bottom line is we did not get RAM written with our with our value five. We should expect to see a five here, and that did not happen. Although I did see write enable come high, which meant that it, it attempted to write something into RAM, but it did not do it. So we're gonna need to reset the program and look at it again because it looked like things were happening, but um RAM ultimately did not get updated with a five. So let's reset the program. I'm going to do one clock tick at a time because I think the half ticks are confusing me. So it, so a manual full cycle tick is F9. So let's do an F9. So there's one clock tick that put two in. There is a, another clock tick that stuck two into D. Another clock tick that stuck three into the A register. Another clock tick that did the summation of DNA. Another clock tick that's about to load zero into the A register. Okay, so this instruction, when I tick it, should write five into RAM. However, out M does not have five in it. So we are not getting the result of the ALU into out M. That's the problem. Okay, so let's take the clock. So two is in the address register. What I'm confused by is why did this jump over this instruction? I'm gonna do this again. I keep I keep wondering why this did not step to EC10. Reset simulation. Everything is off. We're at zero. So I hit F9. And we got two loaded into address M. When I hit F9 again, it's jumping to address two. It should not do that because there's no jump instruction. That could very well be a problem. So what I think that means is um, there's not enough check in the control logic for the jump to not load the program counter when we have an A instruction. That is my theory. So let's look up the load control circuit. And sure enough, the I bit matters, and I didn't hook it up. Yeah, that's exactly why. So in order for this to be, if any of these are one, that's fine. However, we do not want to load if the I bit is zero, right? Because the I bit being zero indicates that it's an, that it's a, an A instruction. We only want to do this if this is a C instruction. So... Uh, what we need to do, uh, probably the simplest thing is to put another gate in here. Let's take this off. So 
Let's move all these values over. So I needs to be low and the output of our jump instruction here needs to be high in order for the output to be high. So that sounds like an AND gate to me. With with uh, not a five input, but a two input with the I instruction. So we need a, let's pull our tunnel over. And this is our, our I bit, not instruction, I bit. And then this, top input needs to be negated because we want when i is false and then when this is true if when when both of those are are the case then we want our output to be true now i bet you this problem goes away okay so let's go back now Let's, let's just reset the simulation. Okay, now let's take the clock. So we loaded two. Now we should get, and we did not get the next instruction. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. This is wrong, 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 wrong. Um, goodness. So the load instruction can only occur on a C instruction, and the C instruction is the one that has the has a one in it in the I bit. So I negated this incorrectly. So yeah, so when the I bit has a one in it, that means we have a C instruction, and that means it's okay to load. If we have a zero in the I bit, that means we have an A instruction. That's an addressing instruction. That means we do not load the program counter uh, with whatever's in the A register. Phew, okay. So let's turn that off. I'm gonna save it. Oops, and it didn't connect my eye bit. Okay. Yeah, let's see what happens now. So let's reset the simulation. All right, one tick. Okay, now this is looking better now. Okay, so one tick moved us one instruction. We got a two in the address M, which is right, because we just loaded two. Program counter is now uh, one, so it's, that's the first, or it's uh, byte number one, that's byte zero, that's byte one. So now we're sitting on EC10. So now this should put um, two into D and advance the program counter, and it does. Uh, again, we can't see D because it's not exposed. Uh, so this this should put three into the address register and then advance the program counter. Okay, and it does. And this should now sum uh, two and three and stick it into out M because that's the output of the ALU. Hmm, interesting. And it did not. So out out M right now should have five in it. And it has zero. So there's still a bug, but we're making progress. So what do we know? We know that the address register, the A register, is getting its constant values, two and three. We know that the program counter is ticking by one every time we click tick the clock, which is good. And and we're getting instructions fed in one by one to the CPU. Um, so what we don't know is, does the D register have the value, the first value that we, that we put in? We don't know that, but let's assume that, uh, that that's not happening. Uh, if the function bit, the F bit on the ALU had the right value, then summation should be occurring. And even if D had a zero in it, we know A's got a three, so three plus zero should still be three, and so add M should have a three. So I'm going to assume 
that the F bit. So, so there's a, there's a couple of reasons why then that we should we might see zero on out M. Well, one is out M's not connected. Well, if I go look at the schematic. I know that's not the case. Out M is connected to the ALU, and uh, so yeah, it, I'm assuming this is set to output, and yeah, it is. Uh, so out M is we're seeing what out M is at zero. I guess. Well, let's just try something. Let's just make sure that the F signal is the signal that we expect it to be when we get to the instruction to actually do that, the addition. So an easy way to do that is to just stick a pin out here. And maybe I might wind up doing this anyway for a bunch of signals. I, you know, I'm not sure. You're sort of along the ride with me. You know, again, we're going to get to a point where we want to automate the tests, although automating the test doesn't tell you why it's wrong. And, you know, there's waveform analysis. There's all sorts of different techniques that we can do that I haven't really delved into yet. And then we can just uh, tag on right here to the F signal. Okay, so now back on our CPU, we uh, oh, of course, we have an F now, and I probably should have... All right, let me go back here. Let's stick... Because it orders it in the order that you have have them appearing, let's stick F down here. And if I go back here... Okay, now F appears at the bottom. That's a little, little trick that I learned. Okay, so this is the sum instruction right here. So let's reset our simulation. And now we're going to tick. Right, so we've ticked to this sum instruction, and the F signal is high, which F being high means add. Add D, in this case, um, add D and A together. So I've reset the simulation. Now I'm going to step once. And... We've got two now into uh, the A register, and simultaneously, that should that two should be appearing in the ALU Y input. And the reason that should be the case is because the source to the ALU Y input should be the A register. And the A, but the A register's got a two in it. So why isn't the ALUI input? Why doesn't that have a two in it? So let's go back and look at the source of the A register. So that's got to be has something to do with the selection control in this MUX. We have to be dealing with a C instruction. So that's bit, that's bit fifteen. So that there's nothing wrong with that. Now this one, that's the A bit. If the A bit is one, we should be getting the value from A, and I have this inverted. And in fact, I believe on the MUX, the MUX has got it flipped around. Okay, so the MUX has, if the, if the value is one, uh, we're, we're getting this from memory. So this is backwards. I think I'll go back over here and just yank this inverter out. So this actually should be... Um, I and A. Okay, so let's go back to the simulation. Let's start it over. Ah, okay, so, and now we have data out. We have data out coming out of the ALU. We have um, two in the Y, which is, which is correct, because we should be selecting the source as the A register, and the A register's got, the, got a two in it. Okay, so now we're going to load three 
into the A register. Okay, so we, our A register is three, and we're getting the source from the A register into Y, into the Y ALU of three. So now we have uh, three and two sitting in ALU inputs. Uh, and then now we need to execute a sum and put the sum. What was it? It's going to go back into D. Yeah, so we need to take two and three and stick it back into D. That's what this next one should do. And so this output, uh, after this is executed, should have a five in it. And it does not. So the only reason that I, the only explanation that I can come to, because X and Y have the value and F has a one in it to indicate add. I mean, there's only a couple of possibilities. One is the zero flags are set, but I know they're not because the instruction, I've double checked the instruction and it's coded correctly. Uh, so the only other explanation is the ALU is not adding right. It's been tested, you know, not rig not the rig rigorous testing, but, it, you know, we did go back and, and, and test it. So let's go look at the ALU. Ah, and there it is right there. The, the adder has been, you know, encountered this bug again. And when it was loaded in to the project, uh, it didn't use the original definition. It, it used the uh, the logis, the large logism definition of the component. And so now the adder is disconnected from the ALU, which of course is why when you flip on F, it doesn't actually add. Okay, so let's fix the ALU. Okay, I think that fixes the ALU. Let's save it. Let's open our CPU back up. Okay, so let's try our simulation again. So at this point now, there should be a five. Oh, look at that. And there's a five now sitting in data out from this instruction. Now, this is gonna load a five back into D after we execute this, which is basically the X input of the ALU. And so that's showing five. So now I have some confidence that perhaps we should get some memory written, but let's not jump the gun. So this is going to load zero into the address, which is right, because we want to write into memory now. And so after executing this instruction, this should take the uh, value that we see in the X of the ALU and it should it should write it into the first location of RAM. And it does. So we now have our program <laughs> doing a simple addition uh, demonstrate working. By all means, the CPU is not completely debugged, I doubt, but at least we've gotten past this first program.